If you've been paying attention to the news, especially the Inflation Reduction Act that just passed, you may have heard this term called carried interest. And the carried interest loophole and how it was in, but then Senator Sinema came in and, and had it removed so that the bill could pass, all of that business. And maybe you're wondering like, what is carried interest? Let's start by going back in time a little bit. So back hundreds of years ago, there was this problem. And the problem was is that you had people that were shipping spices and other goods on boats. And so basically what happened is people would put in a bunch of, investors would come in, they'd put in a bunch of money to that boat, the boat would go and they would buy a bunch of spices and then they would bring it back and then they would sell those spices in the market and generate a big return, right? The problem was is that the boats were really risky. The boats weren't always super well made, there were pirates, and then on top of all of those different risks, you had the captain could just end up taking the money and disappearing, right? And so what savvy business men and women did is they came up with this idea of kind of sharing the risk and the profits. And so essentially what they did is they said, okay, we're gonna invest this money in you. You go buy the spices, bring them back, and then I will give you a cut of the profits on these spices. So the boat owner was incentivized to go get the spices, bring them back, because they were gonna capture some of that upside. And that, at the end of the day, is the essence of what carried interest is. Now, how did it become a loophole? To understand the loophole side of this, we gotta go back in our own history about 70 years. So during World War II, tax rates went up by a lot, largely because we needed the money to fund the war. After the war was over, the tax rates were super high. For example, if you were in the top earning income bracket, your tax rate was literally 99%. That meant if you earned a dollar, 99 cents of that dollar would go to Uncle Sam and you'd only get to keep one penny. Now, the government knew that this was ridiculous, but just like today, way back then, there wasn't a lot of excitement and support for reducing taxes on the super wealthy. And so what the government did is they created a whole bunch of exemptions and the wealthy could go and they could argue for changes in the tax code that would benefit them and create all different kinds of incentives and exemptions that would allow them to reduce their tax burden. One of these exemptions that was created was for carried interest. And it basically said, just like our, our boat and spice sales person, it said that if you created an entity where the profits were shared with the people that were kind of managing the money, then that, that profit, that performance pay, could be treated as capital gains. And capital gains has historically always been taxed much, much lower than personal ordinary income. Fast forward to the 70s and 80s, Wall Street got their hands on it and said, hmm, this is a really interesting provision. We should use it in terms of how we structure funds because it would reduce the taxes we pay on the profits essentially, or the performance pay that we're receiving. And this really got popularized with hedge funds and from there spread to private equity funds, venture funds, real estate funds, so on and so forth, because it ends up being a really nice tax strategy. So let's talk about what is carried interest. So let's say I have a $100 million fund, just to keep the math simple. If as a fund manager, I invest this $100 million and I turn it into $300 million, that means that I have generated $200 million of profit. Now, carry is one of the ways in which I get compensated, and it's really driven based on the profits that I can make for my investors, right? Remember our boat example with the boat captain and the merchant that was gonna sell the spices at the end of the day. That merchant wanted to make sure that they were really well aligned with the boat captain, and so the boat captain was compensated on performance, right? Do you bring the spices back and I'll share in some of the, the profits. So that same thing is happening here. When I go to an investor to invest in my fund as a venture capitalist, part of what I'm pitching is like, hey, I'll make money when you make money, right? We're gonna split the profits. So carried interest in the industry is, the standard is about 20%. Now some will do higher, some will do lower. It kind of varies, but the industry standard is about 20%. So that means on my $200 million of profit, 
I'm gonna split this 80-20. So $40 million will go to the hedge fund, the PE fund, the VC fund, whoever it is that's managing the money. And then the remaining $160 million will go to the limited partner who is the investor in the fund. Okay, so that's what carried interest is. If you think about it from the tax loophole perspective, taxes for the top income earners on ordinary income can be 50 to 60% in some states. Capital gains, on the other hand, is only 25%, and in some times in history, it's been even lower. So what this means is that if I got $40 million, $20 million of that would go to taxes if, I, if it was all taxes ordinary income, but only $10 million would go to taxes if, ta if it were taxed at capital gains. So this is the big reason, right? This is a delta of $10 million. Well, that's a lot of money uh, investors would like to keep in their own pocket and not pay to the government. And this is where it really comes down to the argument on the loophole or not. There are a lot of politicians and others that believe that, hey, look, the rich, you're getting paid $40 million. You're gonna keep 20 million of that. I think you're doing okay. You don't need an extra $10 million, right? And you know, if you were a sales rep working for somebody and you got a bonus or a commission for closing that deal, that bonus or that commission's getting charged ordinary income tax rates, it's not getting charged capital gains, right? So you shouldn't be treated any, any more special. Now, the private equity investor or the hedge fund or the VC may make the argument that, you know, hey, look, well, that's true. I'm taking a lot of risk here, right? And in the case of venture capital, for example, I may not get paid any carry for like 10, 12, 15 years, you know? It, sometimes it just takes a long time for these companies to mature and, and get acquired or go public. And there's, there's a decent amount of risk that I won't make any carry at all, right? You know, we've talked in other videos about how a lot of VCs never see a carry check because it's so risky. Now that's less the case with hedge funds and private equity funds, but nonetheless, that's kind of the argument. And they say, hey, by having this incentive out there, I'm incentivized to go out, buy companies, invest in companies, create jobs, support those jobs, right? I'm, I'm a bastion of the community and and the free enterprise and you really should be supporting this there are definitely pros and cons right arguments both for and against but because there's so much money at stake it always comes back up right every couple years politicians throw it in the newest tax bill and every couple years other politicians push it back out and get rid of it it's definitely become a hot topic now i think generally if you are a hedge fund or a private equity fund I think the argument to be made that like being taxed at a lower rate on the carried interest is really incentivizing you to create jobs and so forth is a fairly weak argument to be made. However, if you are an early stage venture fund or you are an emerging manager, you're brand new, right? I think there is actually an interesting argument to be made for why carried interest should be taxed at capital gains. And one of those arguments is that if you look at private equity today, it is predominantly white men. And it's really difficult to start a new fund. If you think about a minority like a woman or a person of color that wants to go out and start a fund, if they, if they are in a position that they could start a fund, they're probably in a position where they're making pretty good money. Let's be honest, right? And so what you're asking for them to do is give up that income and take the risk of starting their own firm. If we look at this from a first time fund perspective, let's say you have a venture capitalist who wants to raise their first fund. Those funds typically, a first time fund manager may have a fund as low as like $10 million. They typically are gonna charge management fee on that. So, you know, that's gonna be 2%. That's $200,000 a year, which that doesn't sound so bad, but that's gotta cover all of their operating expenses, their travel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the typical person that could raise a $10 million fund, my guess is probably making somewhere in the range of 150 to 400K a year. And so they're gonna take a huge pay cut in order to start this fund. 
And the reason they do it is twofold. One, they're hoping that that fund's successful and they can raise subsequent funds and so on and so forth. But the other part of it is they're hoping that they're going to make some good money on carry. So if I take that $10 million fund and I 3x it, so that means I have $30 million that I'm returning to investors. Uh, that means that I've got $20 million of profit. That means that my carry on that is going to be 20%. That's going to be $4 million. Well, hey, that's pretty good, except for I now have to divide that over 10 years, right? So that's 400000 a year. Okay, so now that kind of makes sense when we compare what they could make to what they were making, right? But as you tax, if you tax that at ordinary income, all of a sudden that 400K isn't really 400K anymore, it's 200K. And you add in the risk that they may not even be able to generate carry, and it becomes really daunting, right? For those individuals, they may look at it and say, you know what, I'm better off just staying in my current job and not taking the risk. And the downside of that is that then we don't have as many investors of color, as many of women investing. The data has shown that women and people of color are twice as likely to invest in other women and people of color. And so if you really want to fix venture capital, hedge funds, private equity, the world of high finance and make it more diverse, you got to create mechanisms that encourage more diverse people to enter the space. I think the last thing that I want to say too is that at the end of the day, well, this is an important point uh, around you know making sure that we live in an equitable society. At the end of the day, I feel always feel like carried interest gets way more hoopla than it deserves. It was only going to generate about fourteen billion dollars over the course of over ten years of tax revenue. And I just feel like there are a lot of other places where we should be really focusing our efforts to make society more equitable. Anyways, if you thought this was interesting, let me know what you think. Is carried interest really a loophole? Should we get rid of it? Throw, throw your comments down below and check out my next video where we're going to talk about whether or not valuations that we saw back in 2021 will ever come back. Thanks.